Hi, it's David Avern with the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast. You know, much has been said and written about the heart-led leader, which can mean different things to different people, of course. Well, my guest today makes that tangible and actionable by teaching heart-centered intelligence. Simon T. Bailey has viral videos with nearly 100 million views and courses that reach professionals worldwide. And he has a lot to say about the state of leadership in business today. We're talking leading and managing while preserving human dignity with the powerful Simon T. Bailey. It's David Avern with the Customer Experience Advantage podcast back in 20 seconds. You're listening to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast with David Avrin. Featuring candid conversations with some of the most influential leaders in business today. Sit back and listen in, or feel free to watch the video version online. This is the Customer Experience Advantage podcast, and here's David Avrin. Hey, thanks and welcome to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast. I, of course, am David Avrin. And as, as I say often, I, I'm really fortunate because I get to interview who I want on this. And, and there's some people who have been sort of impactful uh, on my life and my career and my and my perception of this craft. And my guest today, he and I go back almost 20 years. We originally met in Singapore. Uh, we were at the first uh, Global Speaker Summit. I'm not sure exactly what they called it at the time. Maybe it was just that. Um, but I've, I've been really fortunate over the years. I've been speaking for probably close to 25 years of watching a lot of different styles. And there was sort of the classic motivational speaker and the mountain climbers and the people that overcame cancer. And they tell you, you can overcome things as well. And then there's people who actually have phenomenal experience in business and take those lessons and apply them and espouse them and make them real and tangible. And Simon T. Bailey, my guest today, is one of those people for me. Um, I watched uh, early on just a great style in terms of, of how to be captivating on stage, but it was the content. It was the content and the messages and the and, and the research and everything behind it that really makes him stick out above others as well. We'll say hello in a minute. Let me do a quick bio introduction. Um, Simon T. Bailey, his purpose is to spark listeners to lead countries and companies and communities differently. His framework is based on his 30 years of experience in the hospitality industry, including serving as sales director for the Disney Institute based at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. He's a prolific author, a Hall of Fame speaker. I was there on the day that he was inducted, and he's worked with uh, big companies, Salesforce, uh, T-Mobile, Stanford Healthcare System, General Mills, Hilton Hotels, and others, to name a few. Um, An experience with Simon goes beyond feel-good content. He delivers practical strategies, impacts real lives, and connects with any audience on many levels with a relevant message that resonates beyond the stage. A powerful introduction written by Simon himself, so of course it has to be pretty good. Simon, ah, ah. welcome to the, to the program today. Oh, thank you, my friend. Good to be with you. It's great to see you. I mean, this is one of the things that we're like the... Um, the bands that they all play on Friday nights at different clubs. Yes. So the only time we see each other is on planes or if we're fortunate to be at the same event. Um, but I remember 20 years ago watching you espouse these lessons that you learned from Disney and others as well. Talk to us a bit about your career. and Talk to us about how your message has grown and, and what sort of drove some of those changes. Had a great career at Disney, made the cardinal mistake and said I wanted to be CEO. Uh, and it appeared in an article. And my boss calls me in the office like, what the heck were you thinking saying you wanted to become the number one guy at Disney? And I said, Larry, I work at this company whose motto is if your heart is in your dreams, no request is too extreme for when you wish upon a star it makes no difference who you are. Funny today, not funny then. <laughs> And, and if I recall correctly, they did have a CEO at the time, didn't they? Yeah, yeah they did. His name was Michael Eisner. <laughs> I've heard of him. Heard of him, yeah. So, so needless to say, my ego was way beyond my skis. So <laughs> in the last uh, 20 years, we've worked with a lot of companies. And I probably would say the three things that I've learned, number one, is that real leadership is inviting people on a journey to discover the leader within themselves while they're following you. So a leader can't take people to a place that they've not been themselves. Uh, number two, uh, leaders are really learning leaders. The moment you stop learning and evolving, you stop growing. If you stop growing, you stop being relevant. 
And then thirdly, when you understand how to really be a leader, you recognize customers will become your unofficial marketing department when they know that they're working with a brand that leads with care. They care about humanity. They're just not trying to make a buck. All right, we're going to go back and unpack some of those um, because that's the term that people use now is unpack. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very trendy and, and real with that. Um, as they say, people don't look for a solution unless they recognize the problem. As you have worked with organizations for decades now, what are some of the common uh, problems, mistakes, uh, misplaced mindsets that you see again and again? And how does that tend to um, manifest in, in creating some of the problems they have? I think uh, one of the problems that companies have is they hire people and just because they have the right degrees or the right experience that magically they're just going to take care of customers. There's no real onboarding and creating that employee experience to get them to buy into this is not just a job. This is an opportunity to make the brand come alive. Huge problem. I think the second thing is they do these employee surveys, right? And, and they do them like, okay, this is great. Everybody beats their chest and then everything goes into a drawer somewhere and nothing becomes institutionalized to change behaviors and habits. So I think that companies need to stop doing employee surveys once a year and shift to every 90 days, reassess how are people doing? Because the moment people stop feeling the love for the brand and the love for work, the customer is impacted because now the customer is receiving service and an experience from an employee who's phoning it in because the company didn't step back to embed the chip to make sure that people shift from working a job just overboard to really going to work to make a difference. Here's the pushback that I get a lot today is I'm talking to leaders as well. And we, we spouse much of the same message, certainly from different perspectives. And they look at me and say, I'm up to my eyeballs in supply chain issues, the great resignation, um, or as, as Gary Vaynerchuk talks about, the great never applied in the first place. Um, but <laughs> yes. but they're, they're so distracted <clears throat> by, you know, what Cubby talked about, the, the, the whirlwind or the tornado of today, right? How do we get them to step back when they're so head down, immersed in slaying the daily dragons of running their business? I think they go back to day one and, and back to the basics. We only have a business because of people. And yes, we have products and services and things that we supply customers, but you got to start with your people because your people, that's, that's where your cutting edge is. So pull your head out of the sand and say, how do we create that experience for people? Because here's the reality, and this is something you know very well. Leaders create the experience for employees. Employees create the experience for customers. Customers drive revenue. Reverse engineer. Revenue comes from customers who have been engaged by employees who works for an emotionally dialed in leader who sees individuals not just as human doings, but as human beings. Okay, let's play devil's advocate for a minute because I know you encounter this all the time. People don't look for a solution unless they recognize the problem. Mm -hmm. um, what I find time and time again, and many of the people that I talk to as well, is a lack of acknowledgement um, of the problem. They, they know how the problem manifests in terms of uh, retention issues and sales. But if you ask the average leader whether they effectively onboard their people, whether they are dialed in, whether they're, they're all going to say yes, because they think they're doing a good job. What are the blind spots? Because I, I've heard so many others talk about you know, they, they don't care about their employees. Everybody cares. Everybody's trying. There's just things that they're missing. Right. And so one of the challenges is in working with organizations is you can talk about people with their head in the sand. They don't think their head is in the sand, Simon. Mm -hmm. How do you help them recognize a problem they didn't know they had, or at least a cause that they didn't know was, was present? So you go right to the numbers because numbers speak, right? So the research says that when you have a manager who's making, let's just say about $60,000 a year, if that manager leaves, the cost of turnover to replace them is anywhere from twenty dollars to $30,000. That's the first thing. The sure. second thing, the other research says it's going to take them a minimum of three years when they backfill that position to get the productivity out of that position. So in helping leaders really recognize the problem, go to the numbers because the numbers don't lie. 
we see um, organizations <clears throat> in very different places coming out of, of the pandemic. Some of them are, are happy to be back to where they were. And of course, the pandemic hit different companies in different ways. For some, it's still hitting them. And we try to make these podcasts as evergreen as possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, others really recognize this new frontier. And others are just exhaling, saying, thank God things are back to normal. Uh, how do you, as a, as a messenger, as a sage, as a counselor, as a provocateur, how do you wake them up? Um, when they're happy to be back to working, generating revenue and recognize what's coming down the pike? Number one, I tell them the world has changed because burnout and mental health issues is, are really real. And I just point them to the data. Uh, Gallup says roughly seven out of 10 people right now are stressed out, dealing with high anxiety and showing up, working remotely, maybe coming to the office one or two days a week. So as leaders, you've got to reconnect with people differently. Uh, funny, we're having this conversation. I was uh, interviewing Simon Sinek for a client and our interview was supposed to be just eight minutes. We went for 34 minutes. We just went down the rabbit hole. And I Perfect. said to Simon Sinek, I said, what is it that leaders need to know right now today? He says they need to stop caring just about the numbers. They need to care about the people who care about the numbers. And when he said it, David, it was like a joy bomb went off in my head. I said, that's it. We've yeah. got to get back to caring. Once again, from a self-identification perspective, I think a lot of people will may question whether or not they're affected by this. But uh, part of what, what I think people struggle with is the things that sound soft, mm. right? They sound like whether they're soft skills or they're touchy-feely. Um, you and I both know, because we both speak for a living and consult, that those who are younger in our mm -hmm. profession love to take our time and tell us about their story. Right. And I did this. I survived cancer. And, 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 it, and I don't mean to mock anything, but we call that ignorance, ignorance on fire. Right. They're mm -hmm. so they're so they so want to espouse their message, but they haven't connected it with what people are willing to pay for. Right. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to pay for a speaker to have a cathartic experience and get up there and touch just one life. Mm -hmm. Right. If I can make a difference to just one person, I'm like, if you make a difference to one person, you're really bad at this. Mm -hmm. Really bad. You know, you're supposed to hit a, uh, a whole lot more than one person. And so from from that perspective, those um, getting a big enough uh, recognition. Oh, here I was talking about the soft skills. So with somebody like Simon Sinek, love listening to him, a, a mm -hmm. wonderful sage, a wonderful messenger. But for too many people who are who are tangible, mm -hmm. who are trying to hit that mark, who have those pressures, we'll see that's what's well, easy for you to say. Mm. It's easy that that that's really soft. And yes, we need to care more. I got an earnings report. I got a file. Connect mm -hmm. the two for us. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that LinkedIn has done, they have looked at 700 million people on their platform to identify the top five skills that's needed as we move towards the future. One of the skills is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is the ability to read the room, read what's going on real time. So when you read the room and you take our profession, what I've realized, people don't hire me to give a speech. They can give a rip about a speech. That's the last thing they want to know. They yep. want to know, do you understand the pain in our organization? And can you build a bridge with practicality that everyone listening can implement immediately? So to connect the two dots together, I hear your problem. Here are some recommendations or solutions real time that are tangible that you can apply. So it's really understanding how do I not just listen, but how do I dial in and offer you solutions that you opt in to decide that will work? We're talking to the amazing Simon T. Bailey, uh, good friend, powerful communicator. Um, for us right now, um, I'm talking to a lot of people, once again, sort of post-pandemic. I don't like to use the C word, so I won't. Um, post-pandemic about mm -hmm. what audiences, their audiences, and by audiences, we mean organizations, employees, managers, uh, entrepreneurs, and others as well. What are they looking for that's different than it was in 2019 or before? Mm -hmm. And a lot of some basics of, of business and how do we compete and how do we differentiate is always there. But there's two things that I'm hearing 
consistently, and I mean across a variety of industries, what they're looking for as a takeaway from not only my presentation at a, a session, but the conference in general. People are meeting again. What do they want? And they said, here's what our people want. Two things. And I want your thoughts on this as well. They said, number one, we want clarity. Mm. What does this mean? What is it going to look like moving forward? How did this affect us in our industry and our customers? And how do we, so just like give us some clarity because there's so much that's uncertain, uncertain right now. And the second thing I'm hearing a lot is give us something to be optimistic about. Mm -hmm. There's been enough gloom and doom over the last couple of years. And I'm not talking about motivational speaking. They're saying, tell us what's going to happen, or at least clarify what's going on around us and give us an optimistic path that we can capitalize on the opportunities. So talk to us about those two things, about clarity and optimism, and how that influences your message for organizations today. We're hearing the same things on our end. When we talk about clarity, uh, one of the things that organizations want to know is how do we reintroduce our culture to a workforce who started in the pandemic and they've never worked in an office building. So how do we give them clarity that if I'm sitting behind a screen looking at a camera, how do I get infused with the culture to go above and beyond? Like, what does that mean? So now when they come together, there's a, there's a double click on how do we disseminate, redisseminate our culture to people in a fresh way. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, we're hearing the same thing on our end, is people want to find hope again. And, yeah. and hope might sound loosey-goosey, but here's what I realized, hope is a superpower. So Dr. Rick Snyder was a scholar at the University of Kansas. 30 years of his research was around hope. He discovered two things, David. He said, number one, there's willpower and there's way power. And I think what organizations want individuals to do is discover where there's a will, there's a way. So the willpower to move forward with business despite the supply chain, but the way power is how do I find the drive within myself that if I hear it, I own it, that everybody inside the company owns that customer experience. And how do I realize that it's up to me and my team to figure it out? You know, Marie Forleo coined the phrase, figure out ability. In another life, we would call that finding your inner MacGyver. But right. figure it out, right? Make it happen. And hope is the superpower to get there. Talk to me about, about culture in the age of, of reduced proximity. You had yeah. mentioned before the idea of the uh, of uh, the mental health issues, and I've seen it firsthand. Um, you and I are both the same that we have kids who are no longer kids, right, in their twenties, making their way in the world. My my daughter, one of my daughters, uh, had graduated college, and of course, very social and her sorority and everything else, even with with COVID and some of the challenges. But she got into a new job, and everybody, somebody had had got sick every week. So they were mm -hmm. remote for about six months, no mentoring, mm -hmm. no office parties, no um, camaraderie, no uh, knocking on somebody's door saying, Hey, Hey, Jimmy, you got a minute. Can I bend your ear? Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. the loneliness and the isolation was staggering. I mean, tears every night. I mean, just the, the profound loneliness. And while so many others say, oh, it's awesome. My cat misses me and I don't have to. There's something profound that is lost in that kind of separation. So I think to your point, companies right now have to be intentional about creating the virtual culture, checking in, birthdays, anniversaries, sending care packages to people's home, handwritten notes, I'm a little old school, to just connect them with a culture that they've never experienced before because they've been sitting on Zoom. And so that's number one. I think the second thing is, and this is a little bit old, but go back to once upon a time, tell them the story of how the company started and how they are a part of something special. Yep. Because as you know, we've often heard facts tell, but stories sell. We've got to reconnect people with the story that, wait, 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 this is not just a job, but I'm a part of the story. And how do I continue to customer experience the customer story by looking at how I show up to add value? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen such a challenge um, of organizations and many of them. Listen, I'm not naive about about the, the future in terms of hybrid or remote, um, but I've also talked to organizations who are saying we've got to get back together. 
We've yeah. got to get in the same room, even if it's just um, a third of the time. I, I was working with an architectural firm out of Southern California, and they were literally like stopping certain processes and redesigning buildings because they didn't need as much space. But for those organizations, this is my thought, that, that think that everything can be as effective remotely, mm -hmm. uh, certain task oriented, but culture, there has to be intentional mm -hmm. um, ways of bringing people together because we're, we're social creatures. Absolutely. When people get together, that's where you spark innovative ideas and breakthroughs, being in yep. the same room, you know, just talking about a problem and the meeting, the, the real meeting, it's not just in the ballroom where they're hearing, here's what the company's doing, here's where it's going. It's in the hallways, it's at the receptions. And they're like, wait a minute, what about, have you thought about, could we consider? And it's in the serendipity that the breakthrough yeah. ideas come for. Absolutely on the same page, right? The unexpected. We all know that even at conferences where you and I are, mm -hmm. the, the best ideas come, the serendipity of the unexpected conversation that happens in the hallways between the meetings mm -hmm. is the same thing about work. I was talking about that architectural firm. They said they were, their traditional buildings had been sort of siloed, that engineering was in this area, and this, but they were creating intentional bottlenecks mm -hmm. where those people had to pass each other intentional bond like everybody had to go through the center core and that's where the break room was and they mm -hmm. said they had a client who who wrote a 25 million dollar grant just because two people who would never have have come in contact were there together in a break room in that bottleneck um shifting gears for a second one of the things that that in reading your bio and some of the work that you do um talk to us about caring science and what that means in terms of of preserving human dignity and all of that as well. I'm, I'm curious about what that means in terms of your your own personal message in Crusade. Yeah, so about a year ago, I recognized I needed to elevate everything that I was teaching. And I did some work for Stanford Healthcare. And one of the executives said, a lot of what you shared is from Caring Science. And I was like, well, what's Caring Science? They, in, they introduced me to Dr. Jean Watson, who 40 years of her, of her research at, at the University of Colorado at Boulder has been around Caring Science. Caring Science has been in the healthcare field. So when they talk about it in the healthcare field, it's about how do they create a better patient experience where there's just not a human being in a room, but how do you care for them and seeing them through the human, human lens of they have a family, they may live, they may die. How do you care for them, no matter what that transition might be? So I started going through this cohort and I said, wait a minute, everything in the healthcare field can be applied to business. So yep. for example, caring science teaches, how do you listen beyond the words? It's not just the words coming out of people's mouths. How do you really dial in and say, tell me more? How do you begin to understand compassion is not just something you do, but it's who you are. It's coming from a place of kindness and seeing that person through a different lens. So now I have applied it to my work. And one of the things that I'm going to be teaching uh, very soon is the power of caring science through empathy, empathetic leadership. How do we understand empathetic leadership and care in a fresh way, but then tie it back to the bottom line to say, here's how it impacts the company overall. Fascinating. And, and it does, it applies to so many different things. But I think part of it, I think one of the things that you do very well is, is when I talk about creating a, a, a tangible connection, it's too easy, especially for the bean counters within organizations, I say with all affection, um, who look at the numbers and mm -hmm. don't necessarily understand the mindset that drives the behavior, that drives the reaction, that drives the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's mm -hmm. not that they're naive, it's just they're not wired that way. Um, those are the ones who are saying, if we just fire all of our checkout people at Walmart and replace them with self-checkout, we're going to save so much money. Um, and at some point, the law of diminishing return comes into play and you piss off enough people because there isn't a real person to deal with. Uh, it's, the, it's that balance, which is real important. So I love that whole idea of the caring science. And, and I look forward to uh, continuing that conversation, learning more myself. Um, one last thing, take out the crystal ball, look uh, next five, 10 years. Um, and it's easy to sort of extrapolate based on current trends and and how current markets are behaving and looking at that as a as a natural progression to where things are going to be. But we always know there's going to be some twists and turns, um, not necessarily just pandemics, but scientific discoveries and others as well. What is what is that caring leadership going to look like in five years, in 10 years? And, and how much more will we recognize the importance of that? 
I think number one, employees will go and look at what is the survey or the rating of a company before they jo join it. Obviously, they can go to glassdoor.com, but imagine Glassdoor on steroids where people have posted videos with stories about their experience, about wow. working with a leader, right? That's, yeah. I think that's where we're going real time, right? And that person will do their due diligence and say, if I'm going to give 40 years of my life to a company, does it make sense? Or am I going to go do three to five and then move on to the next thing? That I think that's where we're going. I think the other interesting thing is that customers are going to begin to look at how are the employees being treated by the company that I'm doing business with? Are they really caring about their employees, paying them well, uh, helping them with mental health issues, helping them just with life and flexibility? And if not, customers are going to say, you know, do I really need to do business with this brand? Are they just kind of marketing their way into my heart, but they're not living how to care for humanity long term? I think I probably think the third thing that's interesting is there's going to be a deeper dive into leaders who may join organizations to really understand, are you a really good human being? How are you holistically showing up in the world? Not just the blocking and tackling of hitting the numbers, being productive, but who are you as a human being? How how are you as a family person? How are you in your community? What's the your bigger footprint that you're leaving in the world besides just having a title and a position? And we have more resources to discover those things and the do to re, do the research. We all look everybody up before yep. we talk to them on the phone or anything else. But but I agree. I think we're going to see more of that with organizations and individuals within organizations. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give an example. I, I had to. I had referral from my doctor for, for a doctor appointment to a different place. And it was something I needed to be seen pretty fast. And I called him yesterday and they said, here's the rigor rigmarole you're going to have to go through and everything else. And we're four months out. And I found that doctor, true story, yesterday on LinkedIn, wow. sent her a private message that I was referred by whatever else. I got in at eight o'clock this morning. Yep. Because Just we like can that. find everyone <laughs> everywhere and yep. we will, we'll look them up. Listen, mm -hmm. fascinating conversation. Um, Simon T. Bailey, if people want to get in touch with you, learn about you, how to hire you, all of your writings as well, how do they find you? SimonTBailey.com. There you go. B-A-I-L-E-Y. It'll be in the show notes as well. Um, for those of watching the video version of this, you can see his smiling face. Um, but look him up. Um, I, I think you, ha you have a unique uh, it, it's it's a combination of of both the, the charisma and the content that make you really powerful and unique and uh, an honor to be your friend, my friend. Thank you, my friend. All right, hang on the other end because um, you and I will talk when we're off air. Um, <clears throat> uh, just remind everybody. Sorry, as I as I pause because I grab all this here. You can pick up a copy of my new book, The Morning Huddle: Powerful Customer Experience Conversations to Wake You Up and shake you up and win more business. As a matter of fact, all of my business, my books that are strategically located here next to my head on the video version are available on Amazon, some of them in other languages as well. Be sure to click to uh, to like this podcast, subscribe, leave your comments below. It's important to leave your comments, click the little bell icon. You can receive notifications, new episodes, and you can learn more about my keynote speaking and my consulting on customer experience at davidavarin.com. Thanks for tuning in to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast. Remember, leave a comment. Big thanks to my guest, Simon T. Bailey. I'm David Avern. Be good. This has been the Customer Experience Advantage podcast with David Avrin. Feel free to leave a comment and be sure to hit the thumbs up button. You can listen to past episodes and be notified of future ones by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. David's popular marketing and customer experience books are available in print as well as Kindle and audiobook and published in multiple languages around the world. You can stay connected and learn more at davidaverin.com. Thanks for tuning in.